Hello, my beautiful doves. My name is Mina, and today we're going to be talking about the old money aesthetic and what it means to dress rich. I actually had the idea to do this topic like a really long time ago, but uh, I just couldn't find the motivation to do it. And then I finally got that motivation thanks to a lovely or maybe not so lovely, a uh, new Netflix TV show that just was released a few weeks ago, I think, um, called Inventing Anna. Inventing Anna is based on the real-life story of the fake socialite Anna Delvey, or Anna Sorokin, who was arrested back in 2017 on counts of grand larceny and theft. So I have a confession. I'm actually not going to be talking about the show very much because I didn't watch past the first two episodes. I really wanted to get into it because I had heard of the Anna Delvey story as it was unfolding back in 2017-2018, and I also knew for a while now that the show was in production, so I was really looking forward to it. But the acting, the writing, it was all just very questionable. Like the vibe was very much lifetime movie, not serious TV, which is what I was expecting. <laughs> but I did end up listening to the podcast based on Anna's story called Fake Heiress, which I highly recommend. And it was also suggested to me by my Instagram followers as an alternative to watching the show. <laughs> Long story short, if you're too lazy to open a Wikipedia tab, Anna was like a master con artist. She posed as a German heiress, stayed in all these lavish, expensive hotels. She spent thousands of dollars on personal grooming and clothes, and she would hand out cash freely to preserve this uh, rich person reputation she was building for herself. Oh. Oh, ma'am. Oh, it won't cost this much to get to West Hollywood. No, oh, that's not to drive. That's to shut down. In actuality, she wasn't this multi-millionaire heiress that she posed as, and she was eventually arrested when her hotel bills and bank fraud finally caught up with her. The costume design in the show was definitely more dramatic and more elevated than how Anna presented herself in real life. The designer, Lynn Paolo, even said that the real Anna was, quote, not that snappy of a dresser. In reality, Anna often wore little black dresses, uh, leather jackets, and mismatching accessories. <laughs> and when she wasn't wearing that, she was wearing a Supreme hoodie, workout leggings, and sneakers. Rachel Tajian wrote for Garage in 2018 that her list of accessories read more like a checklist of best-selling luxury items than an expression of personal taste. Celine sunglasses, Ramoa suitcases, Gucci sandals. And even though it's easy for us fashion lovers to, you know, scoff at Anna's wardrobe and say she has bad taste, um, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. Rachel noted that Anna's casual streetwear look conveyed this idea that she was so rich she could look careless, which is maybe the mindset behind the model off-duty look, which is an aesthetic that is often considered sloppy or lazy if the clothes are on anyone who doesn't have Kendall Jenner's body type. Rachel adds, there are rich girls and international party girls and heiresses who are some of the best dressed women in New York. But I used to work at Vanity Fair, and the truth is that a lot of girls of the kind Delvey purported to be do dress like this. They shop and shop and shop, and despite all this shopping, they wear hype hoodies and designer leggings, the same ones over and over. Similarly, Michael Curtis, a luxury fashion consultant, explains that a lot of the ultra-rich wear their expensive clothes discreetly. He knows shoppers who will spend upwards of $100,000 on clothing from the row that most of us would mistake for just Zara. Eliza Brooks also writes for The Cut, clothes like these are a secret language communicating wealth only to those in the know. Michael explains that looking wealthy is all about the finer details. It's not just having a preferred bottle of wine, it's having been to the vineyard where they make that wine. It's about wearing white silk on a rainy day in New York or Louboutins because you have a driver. So needless to say, all this what do rich people wear talk um, got me to dive back in into this aesthetic called the old money aesthetic that's been popular among Gen Z. It actually became popular early last year, but I feel like it's gotten a new wave, especially with the release of Inventing Anna and because Gossip Girl season two is in the works currently as well. So with that said, let's get into it and find the very non-straightforward answer to what it means to look rich. To really understand the old money aesthetic, we have to understand its roots. So that means understanding the style and attitudes around prep. 
Anna Lingala traces the origins of the style back to English preparatory schools for boys. During the mid-1800s, these schools consisted largely of upper-class sons who could afford to study the classics rather than pursue a skilled trade. This British cultural institution osmosized over to America starting around the 1880s. At this time in the U.S., the Protestant elite, aka the old money, were creating a set of cultural institutions to set themselves apart from the ever-growing, ever-expanding nouveau riche, aka the new money. These nouveau riche were people who either came from poor or working class families or who started off as poor or working class and were able to amass large amounts of wealth due to advantageous employment. I've only watched the first episode so far, but The Gilded Age, which is streaming on HBO Max right now, is all about the power struggle between the two classes at the turn of the century, with the Russells, an extremely wealthy new money family, trying to get into New York's high society. Despite the Russells having more money than the other families, and living in the most lavish mansion I've seen on screen in a while, they're not respected by these old patriots. Now you need to know we only receive the old people in this house, never the new. What's the difference? The old have been in charge since before the revolution. They ruled justly until the new people invaded. Anyways, what sets the old money apart from the new money is the topic of inheritance. As Lingala writes, anyone, really, can attain the money to qualify as upper class. It is heritage that sets the true upper class apart. Rather than excessive wealth, family name and legacy, the underlying knowledge that one's family does possess decent financial means, but more importantly, values its powerful American heritage, is what provides acceptance by WASP society. WASP stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, by the way. Nelson Aldrich Jr., author of Old Money, The Mythology of Wealth in America, himself a wasp, adds, Fashion is a problem for old money. It is no coincidence that the two American cities most widely known for their hereditary upper classes, Boston and Philadelphia, are the two most notorious for their hostility to fashion. What Nelson means by that is fashion is all about change and newness, whereas the wasp upper class is concerned with longevity, heritage, and well, the lack of change. If you look at true prep clothing, like uh, polo shirts and varsity sweaters, these staples have largely stayed the same for the past hundred years. <laughs> in saying this, clothes are still important, um, but not in the way that us outsiders can really understand. From the everyday person's perspective, like, you know, taking a look at a family like the Kennedys that have had this generational wealth for a while now, and you might see a photo of the family going sailing and they're probably wearing neutrals or whites or uh, comfortable, comfortable clothing. When you look at this photo, you're like, ah, yes, a rich family wearing neutrals, basics, comfortable clothing. They look so windswept and carefree and rich. But there's like more to it. There's a whole secret language of presentation that us plebeians were never taught. For example, in some circles, there's an importance placed on how many buttons you should have on a suit jacket or how much feeding you should have on your pants. As Eldritch writes, the most delicious in-joke of preppydom is the anxiety everyone feels about being carefree. But surprisingly, what I discovered is that while this style seems elitist and borderline oppressive with how many little details you have to memorize, the Ivy League look, which originated on college campuses in the 1920s, was actually a response to students' desires to dress more casually and comfortably. Before then, they were expected to wear these stuffy wool suits that were in vogue at the time. This change in style was, of course, aided by high-end brands like J Press and Brooks Brothers, which opened local stores capitalizing on the dominant WASP student body. These companies developed clothes like the polo shirt that was designed for traditional leisure pastimes like sailing, rowing, tennis, golf, etc. As for women's fashion, Vassar, a historically women's college that has now since become co-ed, was the leading institution for defining feminine prep style in the 1940s and 50s. But this wasn't always the case. Rebecca C. Tewitt, in her book Seven Sister Style, writes, The earliest Seven Sisters students wore clothing that was marked by implicit frugality and above all femininity. 
Side note, Seven Sisters refers to seven historically women's liberal arts institutions that are highly selective and located in the Northeast, including Vassar. The Seven Sisters administrations asserted that college was not an excuse for elaborate experimentation with the latest fashions, advocating for a modest wardrobe considered appropriate for young ladies in 19th century American society. Wide cage supported crinolines or hoop underskirts, day dresses, and heavy, plain floor skimming skirts and blouses. The girls started to rebel against the stress code early on, believing that these outfits were restricting them from their ability and capacity to study, learn, and exercise freely. So gradually, collegiate ladies adopted menswear-inspired blazers and sport coats, flannel pants, and varsity sweaters. The rebellion gained public recognition in 1937 when Life magazine published an illustrated breakdown of what Vassar girls wore, which included tweed skirts, Bermuda shorts, Brooks Brothers Oxford shirts, polo coats, knee socks, saddle shoes, and Shetland sweaters. It was doubly progressive because many of these articles of clothing that these women were wearing were actually menswear. It wasn't until 1949 that Brooks Brothers sold its first garment designed for women, a pink Oxford cloth buttoned-down. One Vassar alum, Mira Lair, class of 1956, recalls, Looking too feminine wasn't in. I started wearing less makeup and very simple clothes and haircut. Kind of a female version of what the guys were wearing at Princeton and Yale. I was dressing to show intellect and to be part of the elite. In response to Life's article, Macy's ran an ad campaign saying that you could buy every item that Life had listed in its article in their stores. In this case, we can see how the prep style circulated around the country as a fashion trend and was not just worn and gatekept by a select prestigious few. This process is known as fashionalization. While this process started in the 1920s and 30s when films and magazines first depicted the preppy look, the peak of preppy fashion among the general American public wasn't until the 1980s. Learn to love yellow and pink. A ties nut should never be bigger than your head. Clothes, they should look like you inherited them from your older brother. This is in part because of the popularity of Lisa Bernbach's satirical work, The Official Preppy Handbook. This book is actually really, really fun. Um, it's illustrated with little cartoons and details on all aspects of the preppy lifestyle, from choosing the right baby names like Bitsy, which is somehow short for Melinda, and Wog, which is somehow short for Michael, choosing the right family dog, fashion fundamentals, and a list of acceptable, low-consequence deviant behavior. <laughs> Whether or not people realize that the book was satirical is besides the point, because in the end, thousands of Americans used it to emulate the old money lifestyle, regardless of their personal backgrounds. All right, lesson one. Preppy come lately. Preppy come never. Preppy forever. Chris Hogan writes for Men's Flare that it was the first time that preppy culture had been distilled into a portable and easy to understand resource. The privileged lifestyle that had taken generations of blue bloods to develop and refine was now a commodity to be bought and imitated. Birnbach herself claims that the reality is that people at the time went to schools and belonged to clubs that most ordinary people couldn't get into. It's just fashion now. I'm guilty for having ruined it all. Since then, the preppy look has taken on different flavors, different meanings, and different incarnations on the runway. For a long time, I myself just understood the word prep or preppy as signifying like a group of really smart, popular kids sitting in the school cafeteria. Because you got everybody there. You got your freshmen, ROTC guys, preps. So even though the style and even the word prep has been modifying throughout the years, I would say that its most authentic incarnation as of recent is the old money aesthetic which leans on not just the fashions of the original preppies, but also the ideology behind them as well. So let's finally address what is the old money aesthetic. I think the first time I was aware of the old money aesthetic was via this TikTok video that came up on my For You page. Why West Coast rich? Her life without them wouldn't be complete. When you they could be the East Coast rich. The poster didn't specifically say old money in the video, but East Coast versus West Coast rich are coded words for uh, old money versus new money. New money is characterized as logomania, the hottest new sports car, spending thousands of dollars at a club, and just in general, it revolves around flashier displays of wealth. Why be rich?
when you can be wealthy. The comments under this video are really interesting to me. Um, Marichelle Smiley Face said, being famous rich versus rich and private. Like, I understand why people have this view and think that old money may be superior to new money because, yes, it's annoying how new money celebrities like the Kardashians will throw parties on private islands and publicize it during a time when so many people have lost their jobs and are dying. But I don't think the old money crowd are literally any better, and we should be careful about glorifying a demographic of people who are very conservative and probably still very racist. And they're also doing the same shit. They're just not posting about it on social media and so not being held accountable. We can argue it's a stupid concept in our society that people who competed on The Bachelor are becoming like super rich influencers with all these Fit T sponsorships. It's, it's a pretty crazy concept that's arisen in our society. But... It's not as evil to me to make wealth in that way as having wealth because your great 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 grandparents were plantation owners. I don't know. Anyways, I'm getting off track. The old money aesthetic derives itself from the upper echelon aristocratic origins of prep that we discussed earlier. From what I've seen, common clothing articles include button down shirts, tennis skirts, sweater vests, cardigans, polo shirts, pearl accessories, headbands, and loafers. White, beige, cream, and off-white are the most popular colors, but black, brown, navy, and gray are tasteful as well. Other things you can find on old money mood boards are pictures of sailboats, country clubs, dinner parties, old cars, lush gardens, floral wallpaper, and ritzy mansions. Basically, any imagery associated with upper-class generational wealth. Rebecca Jennings summarized this aesthetic for Vox, writing, Gen Z want the unapologetically pretentious Ivy League slash Oxbridge fourth cousin of a Kennedy country club vibe. It's also worth noting that prep-inspired fashion has just made a comeback in general. Balenciaga and Molly Goddard were inspired by Feral Knits in their 2021 collections. Lorenzo Serafini of Philosophy di Lorenzo built his 2021 collection around school day classics, inspired by the idea of kids losing out on a year of in-person school. Miu Miu has also released recently a sexy take on prep staples for their spring 2022 collection. And The Real Real, a popular resale site, reported that while searches for streetwear brands have dropped, searches for Ralph Lauren were up 234% for the first half of 2021 compared with the same period last year. So, is there a way to distinguish a true preppy from one who's just aspiring to be? Well, yes, of course, because one group obviously has more money than the other. But it's also worth noting that Lingala interviewed several seniors at Cornell University in 2013 about prep style on campus, and one student, who she calls LN and who comes from an upper-class background, said that there was a visible difference still between someone with new money who aspired to the associated prep lifestyle and someone who was already born into that lifestyle. Ellen claims that there is a certain degree of nonchalance and disregard among the true preppies that was lacking in the aspiring preppies. Similarly, journalist Vance Packard wrote in 1959, the New England aristocrat clings to his crack shoes through many resoilings and his old hat. Dressing too neat is a sign of insecurity in your standing and wealth. So reading that made me think back to Anna Delvey and her supreme hoodie look and how to an untrained eye she may just look boring or like she has no real fashion sense. Maybe it was all part of her charade. Maybe she was trying to emulate that nonchalance factor among the true heritage rich. So what does the comeback mean for us? I've seen a lot of criticism about how the old money aesthetic is built on racism and classism and honestly, it's kind of true. It was very difficult and still is very difficult to build generational wealth in this country unless you were a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And elite universities, the backbone of the old money lifestyle, only uphold this narrative via their alumni factor. Roughly 42% of private institutions consider alumni connections as a factor in the admission process, even though it disproportionately benefits white applicants. For instance, at Harvard, almost 70% of all legacy applicants are white. So if you're unfamiliar with this process, like if you don't live in the US or something, um, basically if your parent was an alum to a university, 
your application to this university is considered a legacy application. At Harvard in 2019, the acceptance rate for legacy students was about 33% very, very high compared to the overall acceptance rate of under 6%. Scholar David Levine interprets this issue saying that many of the nation's best known colleges gave the appearance of being selective only because they chose to reject deliberately and systematically qualified but socially undesirable candidates. And because of the resulting homogeneity of these collegiate classes, it's no surprise that the campus atmosphere would be centered on values and customs dictated by the white upper class. At the same time, I don't think people who enjoy the purely aesthetic elements of the style, like tennis skirts or cardigans, are actively thinking about subjugating the lower classes. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't think that's something that they're thinking about. I hope. At the end of the day, I think a lot of people are drawn to this style because, yeah, it would be fucking nice to quarantine in a mansion with vaulted ceilings and French moldings rather than quarantine in an 800 square foot apartment in New York. It would be really nice to have a rose garden on your family estate and to be able to relax by the water on your private yacht. I think in general, the trend towards daydreaming about how to elevate your personal living situation is something that definitely spiked during quarantine, which is why we see other popular aesthetics that have to do with this like hyper romanticization of your living space, like uh, cottage core or even Regency core. And also is probably the reason why we saw a boom in home improvement DIY TikToks. Anna Curring argued in the LA Review of Books earlier last year that an aesthetic like Dark Academia, which has also been criticized for its romanticization of an elite culture, actually makes elite culture more accessible and improves it in some ways. She writes, You don't need the Ivy League to read Ovid. In fact, reading the Metamorphoses with your online friends might be better, more joyful than reading it at a top-notch school. The trend is, in fact, a hack, a shortcut to the trappings of a prestigious education with none of the expense, gatekeeping, or pressure from parents. So, you know, applying that to the old money aesthetic, rather than acknowledging the bad realities that that would entail for you to grow up in that lifestyle, there's not that many bad realities, but, you know, the idea of like marrying someone who is probably distantly related to you somehow. Gen Z is not thinking about these things. They're thinking about what it would be like to study American literature or take up tennis lessons in their free time. I also think that pitting new money and old money against each other is a sign of changing institutions in this country. Kind of similar to how tensions rose in the 19th century during the Gilded Age, which was also a time when cultural institutions were changing. Like if we just look at the reactions to last year's Met Gala, it's all very telling. The Met Gala is historically and still is a very swanky fundraising event designed to raise money for the Met's Costume Institute and invitees are usually members of high society. The Met Gala is what I would consider an example of an old institution. But come last year, the guest lists have been adjusted a little and we see more and more new money influencers like Emma Chamberlain, Addison Rae, and Dixie D'Amelio. And the internet's reaction to this was definitely intense. There were tons of people who felt influencers shouldn't be invited to the Met Gala at all. Oh my god! I thought this was a classy party. Influencers, the new upper classes, have been continuously criticized for their lack of taste, from their extremely minimal beige mansions, to not dressing well enough to attend a fashion week show. In saying that, as Rebecca Jennings reports, the old money aesthetic seems to me like a pendulum swing against the omnipresent displays of wealth in society today. I've seen so many people on Twitter just talking about how they miss the very opulent style of architecture, of interior design. It's like we're tired of seeing the same imagery over and over again. And so that's why a lot of us gravitate towards something that has honestly been kind of abandoned, like the French Rococo uh, style of interior design. I would argue that we're also becoming increasingly more tired of technology, even though our dependence on our devices has grown very exponentially over the last couple years. The old money aesthetic offers an escape to a time when people read books or when they hung out at country clubs with their friends as aids against boredom instead of scrolling through TikTok. Like, it's not a coincidence that the old money aesthetic hinges on vintage touch points like old Ralph Lauren ads or movies like The Great Gatsby or even The Talented Mr. Ripley. 
Hilary Hoffer writes, at its core, the rise of the old money aesthetic signifies a search for a different time period than the one we were just in, an escape from the trauma of an unprecedented time. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for sticking around. Let me know in the comments what you think about the old money aesthetic. Um, what do you think about dressing rich in general and the differences between East Coast versus West Coast reach? Uh, I'd love to hear it. And yeah, I'll see you all next time. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye-bye.